Hello, everybody, and welcome to our third uh, session in the AITC webinars, the Johns Hopkins Artificial Intelligence and Technology Collaboratory. And today, uh, Dr. Najim Dehak, uh, who is the uh, co-director for the uh, Alzheimer's disease pilots, uh, will tell us about biosignal-based digital biomarkers for aging. Thanks, Peter, uh, for the introduction, and thanks everybody for coming. So today I'm going to talk to you about you know the work we're doing at Hopkins in terms of aging, and you know, and in collaboration with uh, the School of Medicine and uh, an engineering school. And today's talk is about uh, biosignal based digital biomarker for aging, and I will go in detail about what I mean with this talk, with this title. But first of all, I would like to uh, to thank my team. You know that without them I cannot do anything, and you know especially Loriano, uh, he's the main uh, person who drives vicious and medical in my group. So this is all my group, and there's two students that are not in the picture, but they are also. I would like to thank them for the, for their work, and and also for disclosure, we have like several co collaborators in the school of medicine. You know, from neurology to geriatric to psychiatric to uh, like an intensive care. You know. And that they are doing an amazing job working with us for the, uh, you know, analyzing that, collecting the data, analyzing the data with us and give us feedback about the output of the system and how it compared to real diagnosis and stuff like that. So let's start with the talk. So my research, you know, in general in this group is focused in three aspects of speech, which are the functional, the motor system, you know, functional decline, the parental decline with the memory in the brain and the behavioral, you know, aspect of it. And for each kind of, um, aspect of this aging we, do, we study some of disease for example fun functional we do parkinsonian syndrome we understand that you know parkinsonian affects your motor system make it more rigid firmer you know have a hard time articulation so this is one example of a nice example for uh functional decline of our using uh for the for the for the aging population and of course we understand that parkinson also can have some dementia type as well. So uh, from cognition, you know, clinical kind of decline, we study Alzheimer and the, as a type of dementia. Uh, so we give some results about that. For behavioral, we study emotion and depression uh, from, you know, uh, to, to understand, you know, and we are hoping to decouple this information from depression from other aspects of Parkinsonian or Alzheimer's disease in the future. So the outline of this talk, as I say, uh, first of all, I am a speech uh, researcher. I do a lot of artificial intelligence and speech processing. So I will study this aspect of Aging using speech-based biomarker first. I give you some highlight about what we did in the past uh, for functional, as I said, Parkinsonian using speech, Alzheimer's using speech, emotion, and you know, and depression using speech. Then the second part of the talk, I will move to something what we're doing recently at Hopkins, which is literally saying like, okay, speech is one circuit of the brain, is one bio signals. It's not, but the human body is a really complex uh, system. It's not just speech. So we want to study other bio signals or multimodal bio signals. That give us different aspect uh, to understand different aspects of what's going on in the brain while studying different aspects of the uh, different circuits in the brain. Like each biosignal can give us insight about that circuit in the brain. Well, I show you circuits because I'm in electrical engineering. That's the reason why I have circuits, but it's something going on in the brain. And we we'll finalize we'll by some conclusion and why where we're we taking this work to the next level. For example, with the work with Peter and Frel. Well, let's start with Parkinson. So you know, you're probably aware Parkinson is, is a neuro neurological disease that affects your motor system. It makes it more rigid, lower, you know, slowness in the system, in, in, your, in your systems, you know, uh, physical systems. You have a coordination a problem coordinating uh, your, your different part of your system. You have a tremor. It affects about 1% to 3% of the population over 65. It's not compared to Alzheimer. And usually you get more higher accuracy of uh, the clinical diagnosis after two and year almost three years, okay? So there's an urge in developing new biomarker to help facilitate early detection, you know, of the Parkinson disease. And the only way to have a final diagnosis is actually with an autopsy, as you all know. So you so developing a new biomarker to do early detection is really new research, research where we, uh, that is, you know, neurologists and clinicians need that for us to, to work with. And also another aspect of Parkinson's syndrome is there's a lot of disease or central that, uh, you know, that can mimic Parkinson's disease. For example, ataxia, uh, uh, MSA, uh, multiple system atrophy, you know, hacking the disease. So those, you know, those make it very hard, those diseases make it very hard to give a, a accurate diagnosis about 
how a patient, for example, will show the neurologist, how this patient would go. Is it going to be Parkinsonian or hepatic Parkinsonian, or is it going to be ataxia? So uh, developing these new tools or new biomarkers that also facilitate the differentiation between different Parkinsonian syndrome is actually an, an interesting and good research to do. And that's what we're also focusing on our recent research. So, so as I say, Parkinson's disease affects your, your motor system and make it more rigid, the uh, heart co uh, co uh, coordination of your different pieces of your body, primer, that can also affect your speech because the speech is actually a motor system. It has a lot of coordination of your vocal tract to produce the right and uh, quality of speech. So that's the reason why we are focusing on speech first to do our research. And also with our speech uh, researcher, but the main motivation is literally that the speech production, the speech system is can be affected by Parkinson and make it more rigid, slower, and have a hard time articulating, which make it more articulating uh, behavior of the speech different. So for this reason, we have different set of opinions. As I say, Parkinson's disease make us, uh, you know, produce smoother, slower, and less, less extended movement, so which make it transition between the voice and voice not very clear, defined compared to a uh, normal uh, healthy patient, uh, healthy control, sorry. Uh, we can, for example, say, so certain vial, like if you say, ah, uh, can give you information about the tremor. We can discuss later about that. Reading text, reading like a, like a text for everybody, like fixed text, text depending on what you call it, can give us information about, uh, uh, you know, different type of perturbation, articulation, because we, everybody said the same thing. So we can di differentiate what different, the, the different type of articulation for each, Patient versus control, and so spontaneous so, so speech, sorry, can help us find the problem about the prosody, the emotions, for the you know for depression. If you want to characterize, is it you know this patient is of Parkinson also have depression or not, and also give us some information about cognitive aspect, like you know if we this patient is developing some dementia type as well. So there's a lot of people. This is why speech can be useful, and this is a few of them. So as I say. You know, Parkinson's can affect your speech in different in the, in the four, 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 it's all four aspects, which is, for example, phonatory, articulatory, prosodic, and cognitive and linguistics. And for uh, and we can find the different sign and evidence of uh, Parkinsonian and those on those uh, different aspects of speech. And for for each aspect of speech here, we can also extract some. You know, uh, we can measure some features or extract some information that can characterize if something normal or something has some different uh, pathology in the speech. And for example, here an example to show you some aspect of phonatory, uh, uh, sorry, articulatory is, you know, I have here a healthy patient, a healthy control using the Padakat test when we ask them to do Padakat, 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 Padakat. And you can see when you do Padakat, there's a, some stop, which is like the closure, and there's some burst. So you see very well defined, and I hope you see my cursor in, this, in the screen, you can stop and there's a burst. And this is very well defined also in the wave, you know, sorry, sorry. It's very well defined in the wave. Okay, my, sorry. It's very well defined in the wave here. You know, this, you know, this is a stop, you know, this is a stop and the burst, the release. But, and you can see here. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? Okay, good. And, uh, and if we now go to, for example, a patient with, uh, who have Parkinson, and we have to do the same thing, you can see that, some of the definitions, for example, here, for example, is completely gone. The, the, the closure is not happened before the burst. And so here, you know, you can hear this. So it, it does another, another thing sounding like padaka, 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 it's like badaga, badaga, badaga sometime because you know it, it's it's happened that the, 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 the release, the, the closure didn't happen before the release, which may cause the difference. We can automatically detect that. You know, and give you even a diagnosis about what's going on in your speech. This is just an illustration about why speech is very useful. You know, okay. So the way usually we work, as I said, we, we you know we look we are looking at speech. So we, we look at the frontary, you know, or the articulate aspect. We you know we can we have different uh, sign that can uh, affect uh, be present in your speech, and it can help us detect if you have this is a healthy speech or this is a by consonant speech, and for each of the sound, we can extract some parentization, some feature extraction. We remove some feature that measure all the different noise, amplitude, tremor, articulatory issues, movement in the speech. And we can use artificial intelligence, you know, to do classification, to do a bit of prediction or early diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. This is the workflow that we are using for Parkinson's uh, syndromes. 
Okay, so let's see some results, for example, in our previous work and using only speech. Uh, okay, if you have a questions, uh, Peter, can you see the questions? You know, just to make sure, you know, if, uh, you know, uh, no, okay, that's no question. But you yes, yes I can, but okay. no questions. They, they had some issues with the audio. I don't know if it's still a problem. Sorry for that. So, uh, so here we have three data measures that, that are publicly available. The two of them in Spanish, one of them from Colombia and one of them for uh, Spain, and one of them in Czech Republic. And of course, we're collecting uh, ours here at Hopkins that will be shared in the future uh, when we finish everything. But with the IRB, we're going to be making it publicly available for people to do the research. And uh, now here we can have uh, how many patients we have Parkinson disease and how many patients we have had the control and distribution to men and female. And for each of them have different tasks, where it's a certain vial like a uh, uh, test uh, and uh, six text, uh, uh, six fixed text, which is like a text dependent. We ask them to read all the same text or the same paragraph. Monologue would ask them to talk, you know. So uh, uh, these two Spanish data have the same thing. Uh, for the Czech for the Czech Republic, it has a Pataka test, one read passage, and one monologue. So um, so that's the uh, and so now so let's see the accuracy, for example, using Neurobos, you know, uh, the speech database when we take the speech and we use an AI system and try to predict Parkinson and uh, hit the control. If we use the fixed text, we can achieve an accuracy of about 90% with plus six minus for the confidence interval uh, with an area of curve is 0 0.94, which is literally a really good system that, to start with. You know, it can be a high accuracy prediction of for the Parkinson versus uh, healthy control. If you use the Pataka test, you know, uh, we can get 79 plus, plus or nine plus or minus nine for a uh, confident uh, interval and about 0 0.86, you know, at the end of the curve, which is less performant than fixed test. And if we add more, more speech, more the system actually behave better for detecting Parkinson versus health control. This is one you use AI as a, you know, like a uh, black box. So, in, you know, we are speech people, so we understand, okay, which part of the speech is the most important for detecting of Parkinson, for example, using this three databases, you know? And for example, we have five category of phonemes that we can, can, we can list, which is fricative, liquid, nasal, plosive, and boil, and each of them impose some structure on your vocal tract, coordination in your vocal uh, tract. So we wanted to study how those, each, each category of phoneme contribute to the detection of, Alzheimer, uh, of Parkinson's disease versus health control. So we would so we split the result by you know we have three database we split by the three three different aspect of uh, phonetic categorization okay phonetic categorization and we can see for example FT is uh, fixed text the BDK is the the the, the, the test the monologue and the cross database the cross database is means mean we want to see the generalization of this feature across the database so we train in for example if I if I'm testing in Gita I will train the model in neural voice and check and test in Gita. And see how they cross the database and see the generalization. Uh, so here, some conclusion we can see that you know, for example, plausive are the one give an overall better result of everything. You know, overall databases. Okay, uh, th there's some cases where there's better result, but but overall, if you took an overall result, but I can still, uh, plausive is the one give the best result. Fricatives and voice give the really good result in terms of uh, generalizability to other databases, to databases. And here also a fixed text, you know, give us the best result for, for our research in this case, okay? Things can change when we collect our data, but for us, you know, those are Spanish, we have Czech, we we'll collect in English, at some point we have to go to combine and see how this generability system, that we're interested in generability of the system based on language and dependent on invariant uh, systems. So this is about, you know, using more insight about the speech, not just using a detect black box, but trying to understand what are the part of the speech that are more important for the diagnosis of Parkinson? And of course, each patient can be different, okay? So, so now we're we'll moving on to the talking about speech for cognitive uh, you know, assessment and uh, especially Alzheimer's detection. And, um, and we know that Alzheimer's disease is also neurodegenerative diseases that cause uh, atrophy of the brain. You know, it's, uh, it's the most cause of dementia. It's, it has more impact in the population, more affect more a higher percentage of the population over 65, which is up to 11% compared to um, the Parkinson's, which is one or two or 3%. And there's a cost of this disease is, is Sakara. I think that's why there's a lot of research and NIH report to develop new tools for early diagnosis to show that, you know, that hopefully slow the progression in the future. 
So, so that's why we're doing this research. So, so for, as, an, as a first assessment, uh, what we're doing, you know, is we participate to, to, um, to uh, two challenges that both use a data set called the uh, Dementia Bank. It's composed between 78 uh, AD patient, Alzheimer's patient, and 78 healthy control. And for this uh, database, we can have the disease and also the uh, uh, minimal mental status evaluation MSC uh, score. Uh, and the MSC score go from one to 30. And of course, the higher, the better the uh, cognitive uh, status, the better cognitive status. So we participated to do two evaluation. The second time we ranked number one, so our system was really the, the best in, uh, in, in, in this competition. And we, in the, the task here, literally what we're trying to do is detect Alzheimer and also predict the MMSC score based on the speech, the acoustics, or the, okay, you know, how it, you know, as well as the transcript, which is what, what was said. So because sometimes we ask the students, the, the, the patient to, um, to describe what should happen here, dementia type is to describe the cookie thieves. So the old patient will describe the cognitive uh, picture task. So we will transcribe what has been said, and we use acoustic to see how is this the, the acoustic is you know compared to normal healthy control as well as what has been said compared to healthy control. So here the system is split in two parts: the acoustic system, which can use the speech and create some representation and does some classification for Alzheimer and prediction for the score. Or we can also use the acoustic because to detect the pauses, because sometimes we believe that Alzheimer people will take more longer pauses, you know, to take their to think their thought before they say something because they can confuse or something like that. So this can be a nice feature to to uh, to detect, you know, for to detect Alzheimer versus Parkinsonian syndrome. So these are based on the speech and the acoustics, and there's also the natural language processing system, which is based on the transcription. So we take the speech, we transcribe it using automatic recognition. We got the text that has been said, and we use a natural language model to try to model this in the text base. So what has been said, Mo uh, measure the vocabulary of the patient compared to the normal population, okay? And we can also combine the three, that's what we did, combine all the features and do classification and result, okay? So the classification for Alzheimer and the prediction for, for MSC, uh, MMSC, so minimal uh, mental status evaluation, okay? So, so this is the result what we get. So for example, if you use the acoustics, sorry, sorry. So if you use the acoustics, you know, you can achieve 73% uh, accuracy, just the speech and up uh, an error of six uh, in the MMSC score uh, prediction, okay, 6.24. If you use a transcript, just the text, okay, you get better than acoustics. So the memory, you know, about what's the language is better than the acoustic at this point, okay. And you can really see, uh, predict the MMSC with 6.52. If you do the silence features, you know, you, you, it's almost random to be honest, it's 51, it's a little bit more random because it's two classes, 50% is random. And just the, the poses and everything is that's about this, the speech events and uh, a prediction of 8%, eight, it's on eight, eight in the MMSC score. If we combine acoustic and silence, you get 75. You can, if you get acoustic and transcript, you get a 79%, which is the 1%, uh, a, little bit, a little less than 1% uh, better than transcript. But however, when we combine everything, acoustics, silence, and the transcripts, we can achieve 81%, 148, and about 5.9 in the prediction of MSC. So which means that combine all the information, what was said and how it was said, in terms of speech and language is actually useful, and how long the, the, the poses happened and everything can be used for information to Better, better make a better assessment on the Alzheimer uh, versus healthy control. So overall, you know, because we are talking about neurology and diseases, Alzheimer and Parkinson and using AI, overall what we're doing as a speech uh, researcher, we try to collect speech using different um, environment on scenarios, smartphone, home assistance, you know, clinical, uh, clinical, you know, uh, recording the devices in the, in the clinical setting, you know, and we use different as we try to model different aspects of speech, phonatory, prosodic, articulatory, and cognitive linguistic information to do a faster and more uh, precise diagnosis for early detection, for example, differentiating between the different type of diseases, like for example, Parkinsonian and Parkinsonian mimic, for example, you know, and you know, and for example, find mechanism analysis, for example, what's going on in your speech, for example, if you're in your rehab, if a patient cannot close its lips, for example, Parkinsonian syndrome, we can tell. This patient cannot close your lips, and the plosives, like the stops, are not doing, they're not really producing well. So we can find a mechanic analysis about what's going on in your speech to give you a better speech uh, therapy or rehab. 
you know, and for that better personalized treatment in general. Okay, so that's our goal in terms of detection of neurodegenerative diseases. So another aspect of research, which I started actually outside the medical, but it's going through the medical aspect of research, is emotion and you know for the for the for the depression and mood disorder, for example. So depression affect you know as you know more than nineteen percent American every year, regardless of their age, race, and gender, and uh, more than two million of the two, the, the thirty four million American aged uh, sixty five older suffer from some kind of depression, especially they have a chronic illnesses. The organism it developed for a long time to some kind of depression, you know, or some people take the, the news of the the, 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 the different type of clinic, clinic as, as in a bad way can can cause you know depression, and it has it can has a serious consequences in their life as you can you can as we're going here. So so we are trying to do some research on you know in the using the speech for emotion recognition, you know, in terms of using emotion recognition for speech, there's four theories that you know people there's several theories, but we use actually there's two that we use, try to use. Which is, you know, they say that there is some basic and dependent emotions, okay, and other emotion and the combination of this emotion, and that's actually Ekman-based emotions, okay. So we focus in only few emotions, and the other emotions are, you know, uh, combination of those emotions, okay. There's also Russell uh, complex model, which say there's two dimensions in the emotions, which is valence and arousals, and all other, so all the emotions are kind of represented. In within the, all the spectrum of this emotion can be represented within these dimensions, okay? You know, and this is the one that uh, we also use. Both of what we use, actually, to be honest, both of them. Uh, the other one, Polchik emotion, well, it's a combination of both that I just mentioned, and it's more complex and even for a human to kind of try to use it. But the idea here is when we're trying to look at emotions, we're trying to find those, for example, basic emotions that we can detect. And we so we use speech with them, they're connected and tone, for example. One of the applications I started emotional recognition for was actually call centers, you know, how to detect you are uh, frustrated in the when you call for customer service. So, and that's how literally how I started doing research in emotional recognition. And now we're trying to use it also for uh, detecting of mood and depression for patients. And, and we say we get a speech audio and try to define which emotion corresponds to sad, angry, natural, happy, and something like that. So, so doctors can, if we honest, cannot can see the patient, they cannot see them every day, okay? But imagine you have an automatic system or, or a smart device like your Siri or Google or Alexa, walk up every day and tell you, hey, how do you feel today, you know? And have a dialogue with you and report the, 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 the physician of saying, okay, this patient has been down for three days. This emotion has been down for three days. And we're looking into the speech, how did they say, what has been said? You know, we're looking to your engagement, for example, you know, if I if you answer yes or no only, and you don't want to engage, it's also a sign of you know engagement. You know, uh, you know, uh, in same as another sign of depression because it's also like you're not engaging with, with by, by dialogues. So the idea here is really to find define uh, tools that can monitor patient every day, find them automatically, have a nice conversation, automatic system to describe the weather or something like that, and you know. And what are you doing, you're, you know, today as an your agenda, something like that, and report those if something happened that the patient is down for a few days, the, the, the physician and the physician can call you for intervention or to see you as soon as possible. So it's a way to monitor people emotion remote. Okay. And you know, and we develop, you know, for example, we develop a tools that you know allow you to the time to allow this is actually a real work we did to collect data, ask you how do you feel. It's not very developed dialogue, but it has one thing interesting here that I didn't mention. I will, I'll, I'll try to put the audio to you. Hello. Welcome to your emotion diaries. How are you feeling? Uh, not so good today. Finished recording your emotion. Please classify your mood. Press one for okay, two for happy, three for sad, four for angry, or five for nervous, anxious, or scared. Thanks. Guess the emotion of the following speaker. Piss off. Press one for okay, two for happy, three for sad, four for angry. Thanks for checking in. Goodbye. So here, as you can see, we asked them to uh, vote. So it's not very developed dialogue. We're doing much more better now. But we asked them to annotate their emotion, self-awareness about their emotion. That's important to report. As well as empathy. How do you feel about other people's emotions? So we will play this record and actually good talk. And, so see how do you feel about it? So because sometimes people depressed, they think that their problem is worse than anybody else. So empathy. So we're looking for self awareness and empathy as well as the acoustic and the modeling of that aspect. So we've tried to model everything. 
when we do this kind of modern new dialogues. So this is, you know, using emotion for, you know, uh, for uh, from speech to do uh, assessment of um, mood and depression. Okay, so here's some few example where we are in terms of building the systems. You know, so here there's a database that is publicly available, IMOCAP, which is active speech, no, no restriction in the spoken text, you know, MSP uh, broadcast, which is natural, clean data uh, speech uh, made uh, for broadcast, you know, uh, you know, no, no restriction in the uh, spoken. This is the most realistic one, MSP podcast. And Krimadi, which is active speech, it's like a, to only 12, uh, 12 sentences. And you can see that the graph score, which is the higher, the better. We're still working on this to improve, especially the more realistic emotions, because you know, in terms of emotion, is also not everybody perceive emotion differently. So it's very hard to find what is the right label to give the system the right label or the right corresponding information to better the system. So we're really still sorry, we're still uh, you know, we're still you know, working on it to improve the more robust system to create more emotional cognition system. Okay, this is, for example, here tell you how much is spread emotion. So for acting, you can see that the clustering is quite good with terms of emotions. For real data, the clustering is a little bit more hard. So the groups are forming a little bit hard. This is different, sorry, different story. Different language, different emotion uh, types and different colors. So you can see it's a little bit harder to, to cluster on a different shape. So now, as I say, I, you know, I, I was, you know, my background is artificial intelligence speech processing. So I, that's why we, my colleague Loriano and I, and all the team here, we're doing more speech recognition, speech processing biomarker. But when we start, to be honest, when we start talking to geriatrics, especially Peter, say, if you go to neurologist, they will think about the brain. If you go to heart, uh, cardiac, and they said it's, it's about the heart. But geriatricians see everything. Okay. And now, this is, I always caught Peter for that because he gave me that. So this is exactly what they're saying. Okay. The speech is one, one thing, it's one biosignal, and it's one circuit in the brain. We can, as an engineer, we can see that one breaking in the brain. We give us once one information about that part of the brain that uses the process speech, okay? Hearing and speech, okay? So both. So we said, okay, well, now the speech, human body is a complex system. It has different parts. We cannot just focus only on the speech production and that uh, things. And that's what we start thinking about multimodal biosync, okay? And the idea here is literally trying to use different biosignals. We are using for so far three, but we're extending it to gate. I will talk about it later. Uh, speech, which is where we have handwriting, which gave us some information about the tremor as well as the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the memory, and the eye movement. You know, you know, focusing the eye movement. So, and the idea here is to literally use uh, multimodal biosignals, three, three, three biosignals now to differentiate between different neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson, Alzheimer as well as control, healthy control, okay? And, and another thing that I'll talk later at the end is we're, collect, we're thinking we're probably the, only, probably the only side that we collect the data synchronizedly. So we can detect, we can collect speech, handwriting, and eye movement in the single task, which is more uh, important for us because it will help us have better diagnosis. And we also avoid compensating the patient, compensating for that some, some uh, lack disorder. Okay, so here we are. Let's say we are looking to speech, and we do you know record speech using a recording, you know, like a micro microphone. We have an eye tracker for eye uh, for eye movement, and we have handwriting for like tablet for handwriting. So so far, this is based on the, uh, the result, of the number that we get in the fall. Uh, we get some new patients. This is how many patients we have: eighty-five control, uh, forty-six uh, Parkinsonian, fourteen plus Alzheimer. The new number has increased because it's in continuous effort to increase the number of patients and help the control. And we also have Parkinson and mimics. As I told you guys, well, we are interested on detecting, you know, the differences between Parkinsonian and different Parkinsonian mimic, the Parkinson disease, the disease that mimic Parkinsonian syndrome, because that's what all one of the most important issues we are trying to achieve. You know, and this is the, 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 the histogram based on the age and, you know, and the, you know, uh, you know, that we have for Alzheimer and Parkinson versus control. Okay. And this is based on the gender, male and female. We're still working on it. Uh, you know, we are doing really good in control for the male and female. We're improving it a little bit in, in, the, in the Parkinsonian and we really have to do more work in Alzheimer to get more uh, female, which our colleague Esther is doing a really good job in doing that. So, all right, so why don't we collect speech, for example, for, for this new recording, for the new data collection we're doing. It's actually doing it Hopkins and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, Hop, you know, uh, we have uh, the hospital at Hopkins downtown. We have also memory clinic in Bayview. 
And we also collect new collection frailty coming with Peter in Bayview as well. So we are, you know, we are expanding, you know. And here we, uh, we in terms of collecting the speech, we have different tasks. We ask them to do reading, like a reading uh, paragraph, object and action naming for a bigger kind of texture description, like OKT, for example, uh, syllables, uh, syllable repetition, some solving. Those are all where we can collect speech, okay? You know, uh, for example, here I will go you some result, initial result of interpretable biomarker, you know, which means that have some interpretation. When we ask them to do a strip test, you know, when we ask them to, for example, to say the, the word, not the color, or the color, not the word, depending on what class you, you want. And the cookie teeth, you know, the description of the cookie teeth, the same, uh, uh, the same uh, picture that the, the, the dementia bank, that the challenge that we participate to. Here, for example, an example. So we estimated or created uh, uh, three complementary set of features related to cognition, speech, and language, okay? And we conducted some statistical analysis to examine which feature do, uh, help us differentiate between neurological diseases like Alzheimer and Parkinson versus control. And for example, you can share, for example, see the first four starting from the left here, okay? That, you know, the results show that Alzheimer's disease take longer high amount of speech time to complete the task. And they have greater react and have greater reaction time compared to other ones. They take time to react, okay? Because with India, they, they, they have to think that they're, they're part of something. Uh, in, the, uh, in the cookie tea, for example, task, Alzheimer used a significant lower number of noun phrases. So this is more linguistics, noun phrases compared to other ones, okay? And for example, this is the, this one, noun phrases, okay? And the other one is, for example, this one here, the last one here, the right, uh, Parkinson disease, uh, Parkinson disease uh, patients show a significantly lower ability to modulate pitch in a discord compared to control group. Okay, so those are interpreter features that we can give to the physician saying, like, okay, this is how the, the, those population clusters, because that's what we are doing. We're doing exploratory research, do some clustering and see how the different diseases and pathology, you know, clusters, so we can develop better biomarkers to differentiate between the different Parkinsonian, Parkinsonian mimic, Alzheimer, and stuff like that. You know, early Alzheimer, dementia, stuff like that. Okay, so that's that's the so this is we're using speech, and we also, of course, we can use artificial intelligence at a black box, but we're also interested in artificial uh, interpretable biomarker features. Okay, and this number can create you know improve with the number of patients we collect more. Uh, we have an eye tracker, uh, so we direct uh, which is a link. So and we have different tasks to collect the uh, uh, the movement of the uh, of the the eyes and the gaze, the gaze. So we do fixation, saccade, anti-saccade, smooth pursuit, memory gala saccade, visual exploration, you know, uh, which is like the cookie teeth and stuff like that. And, and we can, in here, you can show the video, for example, sorry. Sorry, uh, sorry. Here show the video of, you know, the fixation and the, what's supposed, where is the, the patient supposed to look and where the patient is looking, the, you know, and we can see the gaze, different variation between the two. Okay, and that's that how we show how different tasks what we can do, and it can be compiled with speech, can be compiled with speech and handwriting, and can be compiled with only handwriting, so it can be synchronized. Okay, and here, for example, you see the gaze uh, fixation between a control patient, Parkinsonian syndrome versus ataxia patient, for example. You can see there's some differences about the gaze and the eye uh, movement that it can help differentiate between the two. So here, some initial statistical analysis about some features we extracted using the eye movement. So we can, so we can, so here we can determine when a subject look at each word in the stroke test. For example, the stroke test is the one at the top, okay, and calculate the metric about their gaze. For example, we can see the differences, the difference number of times the subject look at the words, okay. So people come back to the words, okay, and we can see that Alzheimer patient also. Often rule look at the word much more often than control or other disease. So as I'm not sure about them, such that they come back to the come back to the word several times. Okay, this is how the system is actually uh, telling us. Okay, we can also analyze, for example, where we have a fixation when we look, where the you know um, when I look when reading when reading a word. Okay, in the bottom. Okay, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, yes. So in the bottom, what we can see, you know, we can ask, see the patient where they look, okay? And, uh, and you know, they, we can see the difference in their gaze, okay? You know, where they're supposed to look and where they're looking, we see the difference in the gaze. 
And we can see that Parkinson's subject has much more variability in the location of the gaze compared to control or disease. So each disease is given a different type of feature that are significant enough that we can report it. Okay, so here, for example, Alzheimer come back to the worst over time, you know, fixation and location and how the, the, the difference is different between uh, the, the fixation and the, and the gaze is, for example, Parkinson's disease had more variability there than Alzheimer and other diseases, uh, other diseases. Okay, the third modality is handwriting and we have a tablet and uh, we, can collect, we can collect the X and Y over time, the, the protein over time. Okay, uh, under pressure, and we'll also collect in the air. So when the the pool the pen is up and down, okay. So we can have we have all this information. We have a different task, you know, copy image, uh, copy uh, copy cube, copy text, you know. And we, we and here the idea here we do to mo to model evaluate the uh, motor fit function, including co uh, the, the coordination, the tremor, cognitive function, because we have to do some task, for example, arithmetic or something like that. I'll talk about that later. And this is here. Some type of examples of control patient, PD, Parkinson's disease patient, and ataxia patient. You know, you see that the difference on you know written and how it's not stable, even when pen in the air. You know, and here we analyze few features that uh, seems to to give some uh, separation between uh, normal disease and uh, control. For example, in copy image, in copy image, Alzheimer use more amount of uh, more amount of points. So they took, for example, if they have to write, they, 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 uh, well, they draw a box, they will take a more amount of points to write that box. And also they take more time. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm using the mouse and it's causing me to, to switch. So they use more times compared to any other disease to complete the task, okay? And that's make, for example, differentiate between Alzheimer's and the rest of the diseases, okay? So those are our their features. We can also do artificial intelligence here, a recap of the result when we say, I can uh, have handwriting, I have separate tasks, okay, copy cup, uh, copy code tube, copy image, or uh, eye tracking a stroke test, or stroke only text, or, or something like that, or speech, rambo pass, or something like that. And we can extract several features, or we can give it to an AI, like an artificial intelligence system, which is a deep learning system, and we can, or, or other models, and we can predict, you know, the accuracy, okay? And you can see, for example, uh, handwriting give us 60% accuracy, uh, eye tracker 70% between differences between Parkinson and control, okay? You know, and we are still building. Speech give you 75%, remember, it was about 75 to, you know, uh, for, you know, should be more higher because we, we don't have too much data uh, from, to, to get more better result. And um, however, if we fuse everything at the fuse at the score level, so we build a system, we get the scores, then we combine the score to make a final decision, this is using the score, uh, we can get 83%. So combi combining all modalities actually much, much better than just using a single modality for this aspect. And that's what we are, what we're hoping for, and that's what we're getting results looking at. However, as I said, the fusion I showed you earlier is about scores, but we are not looking at the, uh, you know, at the synchronization itself. For example, when two modalities are synchronized, we should take advantage of that. Okay. For example, here an example of speech, handwriting, and eye movement at the same time. So the plus is the, the fixation where they're fixing, and the green is when the point is up, and the speech is a speech, and and the the text is written, you know, the digit is written with with the handwriting. So we can see the fixation, the handwriting, the speech, and the same time, and you know, and you and, and, it, and it's all synchronized. So we can have a synchronized task. Okay. So we have we have a task where three of them are combined synchronized. We have a task of two 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 modalities that are synchronized, but here we have three of them synchronized for this task. What are we also so this is what we have doing so far. What are we going with it? So we're actually adding more more modalities. For example, we're adding gates. And this is research going uh, collaboration with FDA. Uh, we have this uh, uh, this the, the different sensors and the pad that with different sensors, and we're trying to detect uh, the, uh, the, the, the 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 patient postures when they walk. And when you test for assessment for Parkinson, you know, make Alzheimer a little bit, not that much, but also for for, for research that we're doing with which is frailty. 
And we're adding more, more biosignals like heart rate and everything. We're trying, trying to develop new, uh, new device that can allow us to do that. And we're also adding more vision, you know, this is because this is wearable devices. We want to be also do uh, without wearable, it's like wireless uh, things. So that's what we're looking for. So we're adding more modalities and gate is one of them that we're trying to, uh, to add. As a conclusion, so, so the computation, I, show, I hope I shall be able to show you our important really the speech biosignal can be used to detect assess knowledge of the diseases or disorder. You know, it's not by the best by itself, but it can give you a nice indication. And the speech pathology, speech, sorry, speech biosignals can also help you detect and monitor emotional and mental health status. Okay. Uh, so far, we, we did not do any, the, the, um, uh, the, no depression was assessed during the, for the neural diseases experiments we had. So this is in the future, we'll probably start doing some depression assessment from speech as well to see is the difference in speech, for example, is a, is a speech during depression or because of the, the pathology or something like that. Uh, we propose a new data set for multimodal synchronized biosignals and uh, multiple biosignals can give us, can give complete new information. That's what the fusion will hope to give you better accuracy and big, better evidence about the disease. Okay. And, and we also hope that, uh, for example, different disease different, behave differently in different bio, bio, bio signals that can give us a better understanding of the different chances between the different diseases that we're trying to study. You know, and also this, this biosignals give us a nice proxy about what's going on in the brain. So there are different circuits in the brain. So they give us a better assessment of what's going on in the brain and how to, do, how to process this, 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 this biosignals. And also multitask does not, does not allow patient to mask or, or compensate for certain minor impairment. When we ask it to multitask, if you, for example, if I, if I ask, if I tell you you're being recorded, you'll probably stand up and try to produce as much good speech as you can. But if I ask you to do a multitask thing, you don't try to do that. So that's the reason why we believe that multitask is a good thing to, to do. Uh, as future work, we are look, designing a new biomarker for neural diseases, you know, compared to part control and differentiate between different neural diseases like Parkinsonian and Parkinsonian mimic is one of, and Alzheimer is one of our most important research going for so far. Combine information from multi-model synchronized biosignal signals. We are not using synchronized yet. We students are working on it because we need more data to do that. And we are already doing longitudinal studies. So a patient of every, they're coming back almost every six months or something like that. So we collected data over time, you know, and uh, and the system is you know see the difference and how the system how the the biosignals are decreasing or uh, decreasing or increasing their the quality. And uh, the last thing is we are also doing some research with actually Peter and Jeremy. Uh, in frailty, and we're trying to do a frailty assessment using digital biosignals. You know, that's why one of the gates is one of the things there for frailty. If we're trying to study the different as the different um, the stage of frailty between robust, peripheral, frail, and uh, disabled. Uh, all right, so that's it. That's my talk. I hope uh, you know you enjoyed it, and uh, I'm here for any questions you can ask. Thank you, Najim. I think we have tons of questions. Um, so I'll start with a question from uh, Paul Fentress, who asked which audio features are being used for these predictions, MFCC, MEL, or Chroma? Uh, so we use MFCCs for the automatic system, you know, uh, you know that's the most thing. Uh, we try to, um, to train the feature itself. You know, when you do DNM, you can give a wave as audio, so you can new develop new features. But MFCCs uh, and uh, and also uh, Open Smile. Open Smile have a lot of things about jitter, shimmer, uh, different depression in the pitch. You know, you know that's also was used. So yes, so MFCCs as well as the Open Smile feature, which is the different categorization of pitch, prosody, and everything combined. Thank you, Najin. Uh, question from uh, Oishi. As you said in the introduction, the current clinical difficulty is not in distinguishing uh, Parkinsonian dementia or PD from healthy subject, it is difficulty in separating PD from PD mimics. Yep. Do you have data showing how AI can help differentiate PD from yes. uh, PSP, MSA, vascular Parkinsonism, ataxia, etc.? Okay, that's the what we're aiming for, 100%. You're right, 100%. So what happened was we in the in the category of 
Parkinson mimic, we have all of them are grouped at once, which is a mis we, we don't have enough patients by each category to be split them together, but we're collecting more data to do that. Okay, so we don't, we're not at the stage yet, but that's our goal. That's really our, exactly our goal. What you listed here, it's actually exactly what our goal is, just we don't have enough data yet because we started a year, two years ago during the pandemic. But the Parkinson mimic have ataxia, have things, but we are building it as a group because we don't have enough representation for each category to separate them. But we're going for that. But we don't have the high accuracy, high significant result to tell the to say it's with the high significant confidence that we can do it. Yes. Yes. That's right. the reason why I didn't show that's why the reason why I didn't show the part I didn't talk about too much about Parkinson mimic because of that. You know. Thank you. That's a good question. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve. So stay tight. There will yes, be uh, happy send me send me an email, please send me an email if you ask. No, we, have, we have more questions. I meant for, for that specific mimics uh, question. Stay tight. I'm sure there will be more, more details in the future. Uh, Quincy Samos asked regarding emotion, is there technology that has been developed and refined in lie detector tests that is transferable? Um, what do you mean by transferable? <laughs> that good. you can borrow it. I, I, I guess yes, yes. Right? Uh, yes. that you yes. can borrow it from, from the lie detector test to, to assess for emotions. Yes, uh, so the lie detector tests use e, like uh, the, the, the movement and everything. So speech is one of them, but not enough. So yes, that, 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 it's not there yet, you know, as I say, uh, um, but you can borrow, I agree. So there's, there's even research of, are you lying or not with, with using speech? There's a lot of technology that to do that. And the, uh, the lie detection, you know, uh, is also a, a, a good example. But yes, we can detect from that. But, uh, but there is, you know, there is uh, the lie detector. I only use speech, but the lie detector had also the the the, um, the sweat and also if I'm correctly, I'm not remember the names, but it has a multi model and also the heartbeat. So so it's a combination of everything. And yes, but I don't have it that yet. And we're trying to yes, I agree. But there's not really research in that aspect for emotion for that application for depression or something like that. But no. B building on that question, uh, back to Paul Fentress, who is asking uh, along the line of Quincy's question, have you discovered what the ideal length of audio is when predicting the emotional state in number of seconds? Oh, that's uh, okay. That's, that's two different things here, okay? Because remember, I, I talked about engagement. More you gave me speech, more I did that your emotion and mood better, but also how much it press because people start to say yes or no and mean that I, if even if I said yes or no I would not be able to detect by high accuracy your emotion but the the short sentence is actually an indication of the uh, it can be an indication of depression so for example um, depressed people the the, the 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 duration of the phonemes are longer for depressed people than normal people so they talk slower they don't want to engage so yes, so the higher the better. In speech technology, the higher the better. Uh, in ours, to be honest, our technology tend to work better after 10 seconds. Less than 10 seconds is always tricky. You have to combine with several things to help it, okay? But 10 seconds and higher is usually what's the best. Um, but uh, but uh, yes, but the duration is also an indication of a mental status, not just if you're talking for, if your answer is yes or no, you're not engaging with me. Which means it's a really serious thing, you know. You know. So yes. So I hope that answered the question. But ten second is the minimum that I would say more completely that the system will behave, be, start to behave correctly. Uh, but we deal with three seconds. We deal. So this um, result I gave you here are small snippet, and the average is three seconds. And the system is not behaving as well as we thought. But at ten second, the system is behaving better. The result I gave you guys is with an average of two to three seconds per segment. You know? Quincy uh, sent uh, a clarification for a question. So I'll read the question again and then add the clarification. So she asked originally regarding emotion, is there a technology that has been developed and refined in lie detector tests that is transferable? And then she explained thinking of tone and rate of speech. Yes, yes, 
Yes, the zero cross rate uh, rating, but the zero cross rating is one of the signs of how you're talking fast or slow or the pitch, the pitch, the tone, yes, energy. You know, as I said, remember we, we said open smile features, open smile feature that has a different variation of the pitch, how they variation, you know, the duration of the phonemes, for example, even duration of phonemes, you know, that, that can indication of the emotion and the depression. Yes, yes, 100%. Uh, back to Paul Pinterest asking, are you applying any data augmentation for speech, emotion, recognition? If so, which kind of augmentations are applied? Okay, yes, we do. So, Seems like Paul is really into speech uh, yes. from the engineering yes. side. We do, we do, Paul. We do that augmentation. We do a noise augmentation to help the system to be more robust to noise. And one, one of our my one of my, my uh, sorry one of my PhD students develop what we call copy paste of that augmentation, which is if I give you a recording and I give you, for example, uh, two recordings, you know. One of them is neutral from the same person. One of them is neutral. One of them is, you know, uh, angry. And I put the neutral and the angry, you know, neutral in the beginning and angry in the beginning, you know, you know, and I ask you, what is the emotion of the speech? You would tell me angry because angry, the, you know, increase over neutral. So this is a, a psychological, you know, it come from psychology and everything, probably psychiatric, probably Quincy would know whether that then that mean that aspect. So what we did is we command the speech duration by adding neutral to some uh, no neutral emotions to add more speech to the emotion and it helped. So remember we asked me how much duration of speech you are going to that. That's how we solve the problem of having a small segment of two seconds, three seconds. We concatenated with neutral and uh, other like an angry or an like or sad or something. And the neutral was wiped and uh, because people think, okay, I only wanted to see the, the more significant emotion that is not neutral. And that's what we call copy paste. And based on the result, they help us improve the system dramatically to add more speech segment to the system. Yes. I think and we, can also, we can also combine angry and angry. So for example, so angry, angry, stay angry. A neutral angry, stay angry. So we can add more emotions by combining angry and angry and add that documentation. And we call it copy paste. If you send me an email, I'll be happy to share with you the papers. But yes, yes, we do that augmentation in the uh, audio signal level, which is just a noise to have the system see more noise and more environmental system. Uh, and also copy paste, which we, we add more combined emotions to have a longer speech and the system behave more better about that. Great. Uh, those were all the questions, Najim. Um, so thank you for I didn't see one. Oh, yes. Is it okay if you are appending neutral audio and other emotions if the model is already trained on the neutral emotion by itself? Yes, you will see the last thing. The model will tend to say the last, you know, the last few things. So, yes, it's, it, uh, it's, it, we, we use that from psychology theory and we apply that to things that seem to work because the system tends to remember at the end what's what's the output and yet if you put the, the angry at the end you're you're okay with that i hope i answered that question but that's what we believe the number are there and we did a lot of analysis and that's what we believe that is happening wonderful thank you najim for a wonderful presentation thought provoking i just want to take this chance to remind everybody of the goal of the johns hopkins artificial intelligence and technology collaboratory is for us all to work together to bring clinicians, engineers, clinician scientists uh, from different domains of clinical science, all focused on serving older adults, building new technologies. We are about to launch our third RFA. So if you have an idea, if you have a technology that you want to propose for development by the center, please go to the website of the uh, Human Aging Project and uh, find uh, the Johns Hopkins AITC tab, and you will find all information about how to apply, how to construct your application. We'll be more than happy. Uh, Najim, Quincy, Esther, any of us will be happy to talk with you and uh, answer any questions that uh, you think may help you put a better application uh, to be considered for funding. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.